All right, welcome back to Metflex and Chill. This is Rachel Gregory, your host, and I'm here with Dr. Paul Saladino. How are you doing today? Good, it's so good to be on. Thanks for having me. I'm excited you're here. I'm excited to finally have you on. I feel like it's been, we've been talking about this for a while, so it's finally here. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> so um, before we, so I we talked, we were talking off air. I got a bunch of questions from listeners um, when I posted in my Instagram story. So I want to tackle those and then also tackle a few of the questions that I have. Um, but before we get into that, do you want to just share a little bit of background about yourself? Yeah, I mean this is a this is probably the hardest question I'll get in the podcast. Uh, how do you self describe? Um, I was on another podcast recently and asked about my background, and I said. I'm basically someone that loves to be in the mountains. Uh, I like to surf, uh, who accidentally went to medical school twice. And I accidentally went to medical school twice because I went to physician assistant school. I was a PA in cardiology, and then quickly realized that the mainstream medical paradigm that's symptom focused and pharmaceutical based was not my cup of tea. And then I went to medical school at the University of Arizona, residency at the University of Washington. And I've kind of been doing my thing since then. But, you know, I think at my core, I'm. I probably was born 300 years too late and, and I wish that I were on the Lewis and Clark expedition and part of me still wants to just be running around and, you know, deer skin, Davy Crockett type stuff and on the frontier. I just like to explore. I like to ask questions. I like to see what's over the next rise and the next ridge and I like to climb that mountain. And I think that probably those, those intentions, those predilections that I have personally have been manifest in my medical journey because I'm really never satisfied with where I find myself in the medical world or what I've been taught. And I'm always kind of like peeking over the next horizon and trying to climb up to the next ridge and ask more questions, which makes it fun and interesting. And that's the reason I'm still in medicine. I think that if, if I weren't able to keep asking questions, I wouldn't be doing medicine anymore. I probably would just be exploring the world or traveling or I don't know what I'd be doing, surfing somewhere, or climbing mountains. So, but there are a lot of really interesting questions in medicine. And that's what I find most interesting is asking questions around the roots of chronic disease and illness and really trying to explore and, and follow the tracks of others and connect the dots where I can. And then, you know, hopefully add places where I can explore realms where nobody's been before. That sounds a little Star Trek-y, but you get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, I feel like you are obviously a pioneer in the carnivore space. Um, Kind of, do people call you like the carnivore dude or? Pretty much, yeah. yeah, yeah. When I hang out with friends and they introduce me to their friends, they're like, "This is the carnivore doctor." And it's like, <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yeah. So you're used to it now. <laughs> yeah, I'm used to it. Yeah, so nice people. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, all the questions we got um, are all related to carnivore and, and all that fun stuff. So we'll dive into that. But I want to ask you because I know you have um, just kind of diving right into carnivore stuff. So I know you have kind of. Um, well, this, I'm just like looking at my notes because I had an, another question. I want to make sure I don't ask that one first. Okay, so just to kind of start off, I know like there's, you know, looking at car the carnivore diet, right? There's some people who, a lot of people listening to this podcast probably are familiar with it. Um, but can you kind of take us through your, I know you have like your five tiers of how to um, approach a carnivore diet, like one through five kind of good, better, best. Can you bring us through, like, I know I don't want to <laughs> take the whole podcast to go through this. Just maybe just like start us off with a brief kind of like five minute summary of those, just so everybody's on the same page. Yeah. So I wrote a book called The Carnivore Code in which you can find these five tiers of a carnivore diet. And I've been doing an, an, what I'll call a carnivore diet, animal-based diet for over two years now with essentially no, no plant foods. And it was born out of my own eczema and asthma, which were my autoimmune conditions that got a lot better when I completely cut out plants. I also found other benefits, psychological benefits, more mental clarity, emotional poise, those kinds of things. And so for the last two plus years, I've been kind of researching it and thinking about these things and asking these questions and exploring these, these quote unquote trails and these unexplored lands of, of what happens if you just eat a whole bunch of animal meat and organs and, and animal fat and bone broth. And, and, and I've, come to the point where I like to think about it more broadly now. And, and I, I, the term I actually prefer now is animal-based diets because there's this idea of plant-based diets. And most people understand, oh, plant-based diets are mostly plants and maybe a little bit of animals. But plant-based diets say plants are the best foods for humans. That's where we should get most of our nutrients. Animal foods aren't so good for you. And I am going to boldly, on the Star Trek line, uh, take the completely opposite stance. I'm going to go 180 degrees from plant-based diets and say, actually, I completely disagree with that. 
animal foods eaten nose to tail, eating all the organs in addition to the meat, are definitely the most nutrient dense, the most nutrient rich, the most bioavailable sources of unique nutrients for humans. And if you want to eat some small amount of plants, you can do that. Just understand that plants exist on a toxicity spectrum and you don't want to make them the majority of your diet, especially if you're not thriving. And people can kind of move that lever however they want. I've realized very quickly in this realm that just to tell people, hey, you should stop eating all plants doesn't work for 99% of the population. There are some diehards out there, myself included, who will be fine eating just meat and organs and animal fat with occasional carbohydrates here and there. But I think for most people, if my goal is to help them with their autoimmune disease or their psychiatric illness, which is probably autoimmune in nature anyway, or their, you know, their, their eczema, their psoriasis, autoimmune conditions, or you know, body composition, fertility, all these things, I wanna try and help distill the ideas down into the most effective ideas that are reachable, that are reachable for the largest number of people. And in my mind, that's like an animal-based diet. That's an animal-based diet. It doesn't have zero plants, but it starts to think about what the most toxic plants are and eliminate those, what the least toxic plants are and say, okay, these are the plants you can eat if you want to eat plants. These are the plants that might be more evolutionarily consistent. And that's a tier one carnivore diet. That's essentially a carnivore-ish diet. It's like an animal-based diet. And when you, that's a great place to start. So the basis of all of, I think, human eating of animals over the last two to four million years has been nose to tail meat and organs. It's important not to avoid liver and heart. And if you can get spleen and pancreas and other organs, that's great. If you don't want to eat those things like desiccated organs, like we make it hard in soil are fantastic as well. And we can talk about that more later. But I think most people understand that it's well-raised animal meat preferably grass-fed, grass-finished beef. I'm a big fan of red meat. We can talk about why later. And organs as the centerpiece of your diet. And then the least toxic foods, I believe, are fruit. And that's that's pretty intuitive for most people as long as they're not worried about kind of this mainstream demonization of fructose and things like that. So seasonally, our ancestors ate fruit and they ate honey seasonally. They didn't eat it all year round. They didn't eat it in copious quantities, but they ate it when it was available. And so, you know, if you're hiking in the woods, I was just in Montana you know, climbing some mountains, getting out of Texas for a little bit. And there were a couple of huckleberries and I grabbed them off the bush and they were delicious. And there were some thimbleberries, which is a kind of looks like a cross between a raspberry and a maybe a, a blackberry. And that those are delicious too. And I, they're very bright. I'm sure that our ancestors have been eating them and that fruit is a part of every indigenous culture out there when it's available seasonally. Mm. So those are probably less toxic. And when you think about it from the perspective of a plant, a plant is trying to get an animal to eat their fruit. They're not gonna fill it with toxins, but a plant doesn't want its seeds to get eaten quite in the same way. And seeds really broadly is grains, nuts, legumes, and seeds. So that's a pretty important part of the other end of the plant toxicity spectrum, the most toxic parts of the plants. Plants don't also really want their leaves to get eaten or their stems. And the roots a lot of times are defended too, perhaps less so because they're below ground. They have a little bit of defense there, but stems and leaves and seeds, highly defended parts of plants. So within the tier one carnivorous diet, that's a lot of my unique messaging. That's what I've come up with to say, hey, let's ask the same questions that people in paleo circles ask. What did our ancestors eat? But I just answer that question differently. I don't think our ancestors ate a lot of vegetables. I don't think our ancestors ate a lot of leaves and stems and seeds unless they were really starving. They were seeking animals, nose to tail first. And then if they can't get those, they might eat fruit or they might eat roots, but they're very careful with how they detoxify them. And they give a lot of attention to that. So in the book with a tier one carnivore diet in animal-based diets, I give people this idea and this is what I'm kind of elaborating on now. What is the spectrum of toxicity? What are the most toxic parts of plants? What are the least toxic parts of plants? And a lot of foods we think of as vegetables are actually fruit, things like avocado, olives, squash, cucumber, and probably can be included on an animal-based diet, even if you're thinking about a spectrum or a collection of the least toxic foods. So as you go further on the tiers, it kind of progresses from there. And, you know, I think that probably... 85 to 90% of people are gonna do great with an animal-based diet, no matter what they have. And for the 10% or less that, that need to go further, you can start taking out some of those plant foods. Some people might react to squash. I react to squash, it's, it's crazy, I don't know why. I get my eczema comes back when I eat mm. kabocha squash or when I eat <laughs> acorn squash, yeah. I'm laughing because people listening to this know that's my favorite, literally my favorite type of uh, squash. Oh, kabocha is really. amazing, but yeah. you know, yeah. I had a, I had a, 
I, I'm wearing a CGM from NutriSense and I've worn a CGM from NutriSense earlier this year and I did experiments with some carbohydrates to see how it would affect my blood sugar. And, you know, it, it didn't really affect my blood sugar too much, but I my eczema on my lower back started to come back with uh, maybe a week of acorn squash. And I thought, that's weird. And I also don't love the way lots of fiber feels in my stomach. I think that having done a very low fiber diet for the last two years, fiber and me don't really get along. There's maybe an adapt adaptation phase, or maybe I just don't do well with plant fiber. But but those are foods that people might consider including, and they're probably less toxic. I mean, acorn squash, kabocha squash, these are fruit that the plant is putting out there, and they're likely to be less toxic. You just have to think like a plant. But when we go eating tons of kale or spinach or rhubarb or lots of nuts and seeds and grains and legumes, from from my perspective, those are parts of the plants that are highly defended and are really not doing us any favors. The nutrients in them we can obtain in, in more robust amounts, more bioavailably um, from animal foods in addition to the unique nutrients found in animal foods. So as you progress down those tiers, it gets to be less and less plant foods and more and more organ meats. And you go up to kind of a tier five carnivore diet, which I might call like an autoimmune carnivore diet. This is sort of a, a simple carnivore diet which is, in my opinion, nutritionally complete and yet very, uh, very low in terms of how much it might stimulate the immune system because it's so simple. And people don't necessarily have to stay here forever, but if people have immune issues or autoimmunity and they are looking for a powerful tool, this is just another tool that I would offer them, helping them realize, hey, that kale doesn't love you back. Spinach is not your friend. There's potentially a lot of toxins in there that are, that are harming you and you can get those nutrients elsewhere. So an autoimmune carnivore diet, I think of as grass-fed beef muscle meat, grass-fed beef organs, bone broth, salt, and then one source of carbohydrates if you want to include it. And that might include one type of fruit or honey in moderate amounts, or even for some people, white rice, I think might be less toxic in terms of immunologic uh, you know, triggering. So that's like, a, but then, then, then you've already passed through like what's sustainable for most people because it's so limited. But I think that's a really powerful type of diet for an elimination diet that's more animal-based and doesn't have things like kale and spinach and collard greens, things that can trigger people. So there's a spectrum in there. Ultimately, my hope is that the idea of an animal-based diet, which is the first tier, the carnivore-ish diet will be accessible to most people and will help a lot of people get to where they wanna be just by giving them that spectrum of plant toxicity and the focus on animal foods, meat and organs. And we can get into this if you want, but your listeners will probably know those foods have been widely vilified incorrectly and incorrectly just demonized for so long, which is part of the, the sad story. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, I do want to get into that, but I want to kind of reference really quick or talk about something that you mentioned in terms of fiber. Um, so I know that a lot of people get so confused about fiber. It's like, I hear that I should be eating a ton of it or I hear I shouldn't be eating any and I have digestive issues and all this just, all of these things going on. So can you just talk a little bit about like maybe kind of the main misconceptions around fiber and if someone's listening they're like, they're just confused, what would you kind of tell them? Yeah, it's very confusing. I mean, if you look at, you know, what's popular and trending right now, people are interested in animal-based diets and then people, are, there's, there's another doctor out there on the plant-based side pushing like super high fiber diets. And it's like, wait, what? These are completely different perspectives. And I, I'm, I would love to debate that guy. And we actually did do a sort of a debate on another podcast. But so I'll, I'll tell you that there's very clear evidence that humans do not need fiber. And there's two types of fiber. There's soluble and insoluble fiber from plants. Humans don't need either type, not for a healthy gut microbiome, not to poop, not for anything, not to prevent cancer. Fiber doesn't prevent cancer. So there's a lot of misconceptions about fiber. So the first thing I'll say at a high level is that if someone listening to this is struggling with constipation, diarrhea, gas bloating, inf irritable bowel, or even inflammatory bowel syndrome or post-meal bloating, try cutting down your fiber. And I would not be surprised if you felt a lot better. I've heard this hundreds, if not thousands of times right now on people who go toward lower fiber animal-based diets. And the autoimmune carnivore diet I described is essentially zero fiber. There's no fiber in white rice, there's no fiber in honey, there's a small amount in, in fruit, but it's a much lower fiber diet. And I think that helps a lot of people. The other thing I'd say is if you eat fiber and you don't have a problem with it, then it might not be hurting you, but I don't think there's really any benefit to fiber. And there are a lot of potential downsides. What are the downsides to fiber? Well, a lot of the fiber tissues and plants can actually chelate minerals or bind them up and prevent them from being absorbed. 
there's good studies in women that um, those women who eat, now these are associational studies, they're observational, but the women who eat more fiber have an increased risk of anovulation. There's an enterohepatic recycling of both male and female hormones. And if women are eating a lot of fiber, they're probably pulling a lot of the estrogen out into their bowels. And that may not be a good thing for women. So this is called the biocycle study. It's really fascinating. There's lots of studies like this that correlate, again, you can't draw a causative inference here, but correlate larger amounts of fiber with hormonal imbalances in both men or women. So do we actually want to be pulling out them, those, that, all those hormones from that normal enterohepatic recycling? There's also great studies that show that minerals like zinc present in oysters um, are chelated by a lot of the minerals or the large molecules like phytic acid and oxalates that often accompany fiber. There's a fantastic study that I reference in the book in which people were given zinc in oysters and they see a blood level of zinc spike dramatically. Then they're given oysters with black beans and it's less and then they're given oysters with black beans and tortillas. I don't think anybody eats like a oyster taco with black <laughs> beans and tortillas, but you get the idea. Black beans and tortillas are high in phytic acid. And the amount of zinc absorption, the amount of zinc level increase in the blood is essentially completely stopped. It's, we would call it, say, abrogated in medicine. It's, it's just flatlined. You don't get any zinc absorbed when you eat this mineral with the fiber in these foods and the chelating molecules that accompanies them. So these are the potential downsides of fiber. Now, again, from my perspective, I think our ancestors, ancestors probably had it from time to time, but I don't think they made it the majority of their diet. And my professional, clinical, scientific opinion is that making fiber the focus of your diet is the wrong way to go. The way to fix your gut is not to increase the fiber. It's probably to decrease the fiber. Now, what would the arguments against this be? The first one is constipation. But when you really look at the data, there's no data that fiber fixes constipation. It may give you bigger poops, but it doesn't make pooping easier for the people that struggle with it. And there's lots of data about this. It doesn't make you use lax laxatives less, doesn't make it less painful, doesn't you know decrease bleeding, but it will make the poops bigger, which can actually make them more painful. I and now hundreds of thousands of other people, hundreds or thousands of other people can attest to the fact that it's easy to poop every day without fiber in your diet. And there's a great study from the World Journal of Gastroenterology in 2012 that shows that in a group of people with idiopathic constipation, the removal of fiber, the complete removal of fiber led to the best outcome. And that was 100% resolution of gas bloating and constipation. That's the complete removal of fiber. The other, the other critics or the other criticisms of low fiber diets are that, what about the microbiome? Doesn't our microbiome need fiber? And the answer is it doesn't. The first sort of even prelude answer is that we don't even know what a healthy microbiome is, but I think the best characterization of a quote healthy microbiome is the microbiome, the collection of gut bugs, quote unquote, that you have in your gut when you are a healthy individual, when you don't have eczema, when you poop regularly, when you don't have gas or bloating or other issues that are related to your bowels or that are autoimmune. That's a healthy gut microbiome. As, like I said, I have had essentially zero fiber for the last two years, and I recently did a, a test from Longevity called Gut Bio. And my gut diversity was 94, which means it was more diverse than 94% of people they test. And I have zero fiber in my diet. That's another criticism of fiber to say, oh, you need fiber for a, a, a diverse microbiome, and that's absolutely false. There's good evidence that fiber, plant fiber, doesn't increase alpha diversity, which is an ecological measure of the number of species within a given ecosystem. And the removal of fiber doesn't decrease alpha diversity. That's been shown in two different studies. So, and you can see that. I mean, all the time I see people on animal-based diets with low fiber or zero fiber, and their gut diversity can be very high and they don't have gas, they poop every day and they feel pretty good. So who can really argue with that? Then people say, well, what about colon cancer? Well, there's absolutely no evidence that fiber, either as a supplement or in, um, in fruits and vegetables, prevents colon cancer. And there was a series of landmark studies in the New England Journal of Medicine from 99 and 2000 that show that very clearly. And those are referenced in my book. But the studies went from four to eight years, and they took two groups of people, one with high fiber, one with low fiber. And they did colonoscopy at the beginning and the end to look at precancerous adenomas of the colon or frank colon cancer. No difference between them when they increase the amount of fruits and vegetables massively or supplement in a big way with sort of a fiber supplement. So there's no evidence that fiber prevents colon cancer. The flip side of the equation is does red meat cause colon cancer? Absolutely not. And that's another myth that I debunk in the book. We can go down that route if you want, but fiber doesn't fix constipation. 
you know, a lack of fiber is not the reason you're constipated. Fiber doesn't increase alpha diversity. We don't need fiber for a, quote, healthy microbiome. Fiber doesn't prevent cancer. Fiber doesn't prevent diverticulosis. Like, why do we eat fiber in the first place? If it comes in the foods we eat, then great if you don't have a problem with it. But for a lot of people who still struggle with GI issues, I just want them to know there's really no good evidence that fiber is that beneficial for humans. For some people, it's benign and they don't have a problem with it. And in that case, great. That's where the animal-based perspective comes in. If you're eating the less toxic plant foods and you're thriving, don't change anything. I'm just offering tools for people who are looking for new avenues because there's a lot of people out there that are still suffering and they've done it all. They've done AIP and paleo and, you know, they've counted their macros and they tried vegan diets and they feel worse. And it's like, yeah, I think that there's a lot of these questions that haven't been answered because we're stuck in this sort of dogmatic thinking. Is, any other questions about fiber you think your listeners would, would want to know? Did that cover most of it? I think you covered it all. I just, okay. I was just like standing there, like trying to absorb it all. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and listen to this again. <laughs> Not my first rodeo. No. Yeah, I know. But I wanted you to, you know, go down all of those rabbit holes because I feel like there is so much confusion and misconception. So I think that definitely helped, um, clear, th clear some things up and like gave some new perspectives that people might not have, you know, heard before. So love it. Um, all right, well, let's get to some of the, actually, this is, yeah, let's get to some of the listener questions. Um, because yeah, it's a little, yeah, sorry. Just looking at the time. Um, all right. So let me see, these will kind of relate to some of the stuff that you, that you mentioned. So, um, the first one is, do, do you think carnivore works as well for women as it does for men? can it cause hormone issues? So that's kind of like a two part question. But it's a great question. And, and the answer is, um, I do believe in bioindividuality to an extent. I don't think that there are some people that are so biochemically different than others that like a plant-based diet is ideal for them. I think if you look at the way humans extract nutrients from food, animal food is probably gonna be the best food for pretty much everyone on the planet. Now, individual food sensitivities are gonna be different between people. And I think that women and men are different in terms of their hormonal cycles. And I, as I've gone through this process, again, I have man parts, uh, but <laughs> I, I know women physicians and I know women, I've talked to a lot of women, I have women clients. And um, so the best that I can say is that I think that for women, some sort of carbohydrate cycling is probably better than straight low carb, completely meat and organs all the time. And I think most of your, the women that you work with or know will agree with that. And maybe you've experienced that in your own life too. Though I believe that low carbohydrate diets can be very helpful for people with underlying metabolic dysfunction like diabetes. I think some cycling to that is also very reasonable. And so I think that if women are doing a carnivore diet, absolutely. That's why I started with this idea of an animal-based diet. I have no problem with people having carbohydrates in their diet. And breaking from what I saw as an overly dogmatic set of um, thinking within the carnivore community, I've defended carbohydrates recently, you know, and taken a lot of flack for it, which is fine with me because I have a lot of podcasts and literature on in my show, which is Fundamental Health, talking about carbohydrates are not the problem for people. If you are diabetic, yeah, there is carbohydrate intolerance and you're going to need to remove carbohydrates at least temporarily. But I don't think carbohydrates cause metabolic dysfunction in otherwise healthy individuals. I've shown it in myself. I've seen it over and over in my clients, both men and women. And there are lots of examples of indigenous people, the Tukasinta, the, um, the Hadza, uh, the Katavans, who do eat carbohydrates and remain very healthy from a cardiovascular metabolic perspective. Carbohydrates that are not processed do not cause problems for humans if you are metabolically healthy. Again, the caveat is if you're diabetic, you may need to remove them sh for the short term or the, you know, the moderate term. But I do think that if women want to do an animal-based diet, don't be afraid to include carbohydrates on a cyclic perspective. Uh, on my podcast, I've got a show coming out with Karen Martell, and we do talk about women's cycles and sort of the, you know, the follicular phase and the luteal phase, the first and second halves of the menstrual cycle respectively, and how you know, carbohydrates might be something to include in the second half of the cycle in the luteal phase with that increasing progesterone. And that in the, in the follicular phase, maybe that's the time to do more fasting or more low carb or more intense exercises. And so you can definitely split it up. But I think some cycling of carbohydrates, totally reasonable, totally safe. There are lots of what I would consider to be less toxic carbohydrates for women, kabocha squash, mm -hmm. even honey, uh, you know, avocado is moderate carb, berries, even fruit, if people like that, or these are fine. And so I do think that women will want to think about that a little differently. Now, I personally think that men will want to cycle in carbohydrates as well into an animal-based diet. And 
again, I think that the carnivore community just lost its mind when I said, hey, I've started doing that with honey and I wore a CGM and it doesn't look that bad and, and I feel pretty good with this and maybe we don't need to be so dogmatic. And anyway, what has ensued is me defending honey and we can talk about that as well. But and I'm, I got like 10 questions about, about that. About honey? That's hilarious. Yeah. Well, well I'm, 10 of the same questions, which I'll ask you next. So okay, yeah. you so, finish up. But, you know, in, in my own life, what I found after a year and a half of strict, quote, keto, low carb, animal meat and organs was I felt pretty good, but I still would get muscle cramps when I would like climb and have to like point my foot to get on a hold that was precise. And, you know, I was living in San Diego and sometimes I'd just be like, I just feel a little cold. I could tell like my thyroid wasn't fully ramped up. And it's good for us to go through those periods of low carb from time to time. It's good for us to fast from time to time, whether it's intermittent fasting, whatever. But I realized that I bet it's better to cycle. I think our ancestors would have cycled. I don't think they were eating leafy greens and kale and lots of legumes, but I do think they were swiping berries off the bush. And if they could find honey, they were eating it. And in the winter, they were probably eating squash. And so there's even some seasonality in terms of what carbohydrates you use at different times of the year if we really want to mimic those things. But I like the idea of for women saying, yeah, if you want to cycle carbohydrates, do it. Just know which ones to cycle. Obviously, white bread is not my first choice because of gluten <laughs> and probably not your first choice either. Yeah. But but I think that they should think about that. I also think men will probably feel better if they cycle in carbohydrates. Not every day, but if you want to do it occasionally, you, you probably could even do it most days of the week. Seasonally, um, based on, based on, you know, performance goals based on lifting or athletic goals, you can cycle them that way. And the variety of carbohydrates is pretty big and we get into that. So that's my long-winded answer to your question. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna make it easy for you because I like to talk. So I saw No, no, I love it. Keep talking. (laughs) But I love I love your kind of perspective on up perspective on all that too because obviously this show is called Metflex and Chill, right? So I'm all about metabolic flexibility and just, you know, my kind of history of being in the low carb keto space for the last five to six years. I've gone through like strict keto, this is the way to go. And then, you know, maybe not, (laughs) maybe I shouldn't be so dogmatic. And I've kind of gotten to this realization that um, with a lot of people that I work with um, who might not be suffering from these autoimmune issues, um, but have gone through periods of, you know, very long-term keto and may have, you know, wanted to start incorporating carbs and they don't know how because they've gotten so carb phobic. And so I've kind of come to this realization in the past few years that um, I want to, you know, teach people more about the concept of metabolic flexibility and not having to be so far on one side of each spectrum that you can, you know, live in the middle and have a lot of benefits from that. So my kind of question for you is what is your view on metabolic flexibility, especially when it comes to someone who may be following a carnivore diet for a very long time and maybe have become um, a little bit inflexible? Do you have any views on that? Yeah, I mean, this gets into a little bit of biochemistry, but I, I have seen it happen. Um, I I see this in my clients, and everybody's a little different, but long-term low-carbohydrate diets, we start to see that fasting glucose kind of creep up, 95, 100, 105, et cetera. And there are those in the carnivore community who are dogmatic, and they have openly shared that their fasting glucose is 126. Mm-hmm. And... You know, I've seen CGMs from people, continuous glucose monitors from people who have a a fasting glucose of 120 and basically a baseline glucose between 110 and 120 all day from long-term ketogenic diets. So that is essentially what I would call extreme physiologic insulin resistance. And we don't have to get into the details of all that biochemistry, but that is metabolic inflexibility. Your your muscles, your most of your whole body is refusing glucose extremely. And, and I think that is, that is the opposite of what we want. I don't think that's good. Those people will also see a hemoglobin A1C that's often above six, suggesting there is increased glycation. And we know that glycation is probably not a good thing. I would not be happy with a hemoglobin A1C that's above five. And I have seen that in long-term carnivores. They see hemoglobin A1C start to creep up. Now, HbA1c is not the best metric, and it probably is a little bit dependent on the life of the red blood cell, but but I do think that I agree with you that metabolic flexibility is probably our ancestral norm, and it's probably the goal. We want to be metabolically flexible. We want to have the ability to metabolize fats or to metabolize glucose. And when you find a sweet spot, I think with carbohydrate cycling, that is what you achieve. It takes a while for you to become metabolically inflexible, and it also takes a while for you to become you know, fat adapted if you've never gone through a period without carbohydrates in your diet in massive amounts. And so I think that the 
the interesting thing about the ketogenic movement, the low carb movement, was that it taught people, hey, you need to be fat adapted. Most people are metabolically inflexible because they can only run on glucose. But within our community, there are a lot of people who have become so metabolically inflexible, they can only run on fat. They can't run on glucose. Mm -hmm. And again, this is broad strokes. We're not really getting into the details of biochemistry here. But I do think that if you cycle in carbohydrates on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, you will be able to do both. But this is to say that there is benefit to having ketones in your body, to depleting liver glycogen on a daily or weekly basis. And there is also benefit to introducing some glucose in your food. Now, like I said, I've gone... Mm -hmm. I've gone rogue in the community by defending this and saying, hey, carbohydrates are not the problem. Honey is not the problem. I do think there's a benefit to being metabolically flexible. It just makes life easier too. And I think you see it hormonally. You see it different in terms of electrolytes. It just works better. And there's an evolutionary precedent for it. You know, If you're walking by berries, you're going to eat them. If you see a hive of bees and you're smart enough to figure out that you can smoke them out or get that hive, you're going to eat that honey. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, all right, well, let's talk about this honey. <laughs> I got like, um, I got a bunch of questions. They all kind of stem the same, stem, stem to be the same question. So do you really eat honey and why? So I feel like you already kind of talked a little bit about it, but can you just maybe just tell us, like dive a little bit deeper into the into honey? Yeah, so when I was thinking, you know, earlier this year when I was thinking about reintroducing carbohydrates in my diet, I'm, I've been, you know, animal-based carnivore 100% for a year and a half, and I'm thinking, all right, what carbohydrates do I want to include? Do I want to include bread? No, I don't, want to, I don't want to include bread. Do I want to include beans? I don't want to include beans. I don't think those are good carbohydrates for humans. I think they're much less digestible and probably going to cause a lot of problems. What about berries? Yeah, I could consider including berries in my diet. What about honey? Yeah, honey seems pretty evolutionarily consistent. It's raw. You can get organic honey. It's made by bees. You can even make, if you want to be if you really want to be nitpicky, you can make the argument that honey is carnivore. It's from bees, right? It's not a plant food. It's from bees. So you can say, oh, well, I mean, you can make a carnivore diet. If you really want to be that, I don't think that that degree of dogma is helpful for us. But if yeah. you really want to be that dogmatic, you can say honey is an animal food. If milk is an animal food, then honey is an animal food. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, let me try and incorporate honey. So I experimented with those. And in the beginning, I felt the best with honey. And I was always doing raw organic honey. I wore a continuous glucose monitor to look at my postprandial glucose readings. And what I saw was a very, a very short spike. And it would go often go from 80 to about 120 and then come back down very quickly. So the overall area under the glucose curve was pretty darn small. And if you looked at my CGM readings across the, across the day or across the weeks, the standard deviation stayed very low. My fasting glucose was low. My hemoglobin A1C was low. And... I recently got a uh, fasting insulin. It was insanely low. It was less than three micro IU per ml. It was basically below detectable limit of normal, eating a moderate amount of honey most days for the last five months as part of this experiment. I also did kabocha squash and some other more starchy foods like sweet potato. They don't really spike my blood sugar a whole lot. Um, and maybe not even quite as much as the honey, but the area under the curve was, was essentially the same because it stayed up for a little longer. It was like kind of a broader peak. Mm -hmm. So if we're really getting you know, technical about why we're using a CGM and integrating the area under the glucose curve and using that as a proxy for the insulin area under the curve, uh, then, then, you know, I don't think honey is really that much different than other foods. It goes up quickly. It comes down quickly. Mm -hmm. Honey gets a bad rap because people think it's pure sugar. Well, it's pure sugar, but if you look at the research, it's pretty interesting. There's data in mouse studies that Honey behaves completely differently than pure fructose or sucrose when they give it to mice, which is just wild. And then there's, it's been used throughout the world as anti-cavity, anti-gingivitis, anti-oral mucositis, and it's anti-candidal. So honey has all these interesting properties that make it seem very unique. I didn't have any problems with my oral health when I was eating honey, and I spoke to a bunch of dentists about it. And some of them saved, sent me the articles, said, hey, yeah, honey's been, I mean, people know that honey's been used on wounds. Mm -hmm. in, you know, in my residency, we would use meta honey. Like in the hospital, they will sell you a tube of honey like this big for $30. And it's, it's meta honey. And it's actual just honey that is, you know, made it to a pharmaceutical grade. And they put it on wounds. And it's mm -hmm. antibacterial. And so honey is a unique food. It has all these chemicals. We don't know what they do. But it's definitely something our ancestors would have eaten. So I thought, well, let me try that. And I think because I don't like fiber, it felt really good to me. It was easy to eat. It was an interesting, different flavor. My blood glucose stayed good. My fasting insulin stayed good. Nothing went 
you know, nothing went really negative. I think my triglycerides went up a little higher on honey because of the amount of fructose than they would with a glucose-based carbohydrate. And I've experimented more with some glucose-based carbohydrates, but my triglycerides weren't much above 100. I think they were 105 or something on honey and my HDL was 90. So they were about the same. Now, I think that if I did more glucose-based carbohydrates, I probably would have lower triglycerides. And I don't think that's an indication of metabolic unhealth because my fasting insulin was quite low. So anyway, you get the idea. But because of the way that fructose goes through glycolysis and can be an intermediate for the formation of glycerol and triglyceride backbone, if you increase fructose in your diet, you'll probably bump your triglycerides a bit. But I think if they're within normal levels, maybe not a big thing. There's not good data that that's a bad thing. Anyway, so that was why I liked honey. It was just easy, no fiber. It felt clean. I felt good mm -hmm. with it. And a lot of honey is really delicious. I got some really freaking good honey, some biodynamic honey from Germany that was out of this world. People always ask, well, how much do you eat? Well, I eat probably 80 to 120 grams a day of honey when I eat honey. But I don't even eat honey every day anymore. I've experimented with some other carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Like I said, if there's berries around, I might eat some berries if I'm on the trail. And that's that. So I do think it's a good adjunct for people. It's not the only carbohydrate. If you tolerate fiber, and you want to do kabocha or you want to do other squash or you want to do sweet potatoes if you tolerate those if they feel okay in your stomach that's probably fine you can i think even we could even be completely um controversial and say that maybe white rice is even okay you know that's been dehulled it's basically pure glucose as a you know as a polymer called amylose it digests more slowly and it doesn't, I don't think it's problematic for humans either. You don't want to over consume it. There's not a lot of micronutrients in there, mm -hmm. but if you just want that macronutrient, I do think it's beneficial for people to have carbohydrates in their diet. So, but I find honey to be a great adjunct for people if they want it from time to time. And the, the one last thing I'll say about honey is some of the criticism I've gotten about honey uh, in the online community has been that there's a study out there of Hadza hunter gatherers showing that the Bushmen who eat more honey have more cavities. Well, when you take that in light of all the other studies I mentioned that show that it has antibacterial effects, the the rest of that Hadza study is relevant. And what these people who are criticizing me with that study are leaving out is if you read the next sentence of the study, they say the oral decay in these people could also be due to the fact that the Bushmen smoked more tobacco and marijuana. And we know very clearly that tobacco smoking is highly associated with decreased health of your uh, teeth and gums and all these yeah. kind, of, kind of things. So is the honey causing the problem or is it the fact that the Bushmen who eat more honey also smoke cigarettes? This has been my sort of um, frustration in the last few months as I've broken from dogma is that the people in, many people in the community who criticize vegans for making broad sweeping statements or using associations to draw causative inference are doing the same thing when they're criticizing me saying, well, look, the Hadza hunter gatherers, poor Bushmen are eating more honey, therefore it's causing cavities. And it's like, well, it could also be the smoking, you know, it could also be the marijuana. Yeah, all these kind of things. So anyway, it's just, it's very yeah. ironic how, how, how tribal and dogmatic people get. But that's, that's the honey piece. And I think it's, it's a piece for people if they want it, mm -hmm. you don't have to use it. Um, and I'm definitely not paid by the honey board. I wish there were, <laughs> I wish there were a honey board. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Somebody <laughs> online tried to, tried to make this like subtle, not so subtle reference that I was somehow getting paid to promote oh honey, God. which is, which is, I, I, it's the most absurd thing ever. So, um, I wish, like, I, I wish somebody would pay me to promote yeah. <laughs> honey and, and that, that, I mean, that's a very healthy food for humans. Like that's a great yeah. thing. But if anybody's listening to this from the honey board, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm open to talk about promoting honey, but it doesn't, it hasn't happened yet. It's so silly. That's awesome. That's awesome. I think, especially if someone is following like a long-term carnivore diet and they want to start incorporating more, um, like carbs, especially around workouts, I think honey would probably be a really good choice just based off everything you said. So love it. And there's other ones too, like I said. You know, there's lots of options there. Yeah, for sure. Okay, a um, few more questions. So I want to kind of, I'm. oh, actually I have a funny one for you. Okay. <laughs> Why does your name start with salad if you're a carnivore? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we don't get to pick our names. Yeah, so, um, Just, but, you know, my this comes up a lot. Um, and and I've had some- funny clever friends who have said, if you actually look at my name, it is salad, comma, I, question mark, no exclamation point. So the answer is in my name, salad, I, no. Oh, there you go. I didn't look at that part. Right? <laughs> or, because um, it's salad, saladino, or it also has dinosaur in the name. And of mm. course, the dinosaur that I would select would be some sort of carnivorous 
flesh-eating dinosaur. So you can think about however you want. But it is kind of a funny thing. I saw somebody post on um, Twitter the other day that you know that there are multiple doctors in the space who have names that are like that. You know, they're oh, that, really? that are just yeah in Congress. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I saw that one. I was like, oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Um, all right. So back to back to some other questions. So what are your thoughts on pork rinds health wise? So I'm not a huge fan of pork and I'll tell you why. And this kind of relates back to a really important piece, which is what is causing diabetes? What is causing obesity? What is causing metabolic dysfunction? This has been my fascination for the last few months. And a lot of people, if they're asking questions, they've probably heard me talking about linoleic acid polyunsaturated fats, which are often abbreviated PUFAs, um, but that's what we're talking about is polyunsaturated fatty acids like linoleic acid or others that have multiple double bonds. But when you think about pork in general, and again, I've taken more flack from the carnivore community um, willingly and gladly for this, but pork and chicken are not fed species appropriate diets, generally speaking, they're fed corn and soy. And if you look at this, there's very good evidence that that enriches their fatty tissues with linoleic acid. Monogastric animals like chicken and pork can't convert linoleic acid to saturated fat like ruminants can. I definitely think ruminants should be grass-fed and grass-finished if we can find that and afford it. But my fear for people, even within animal-based diets, is that they can get too much linoleic acid, which will impair health goals like weight loss because they're eating a lot of chicken fat or pork fat. Now, pork rinds are pork skin, so it's probably less of the fat in the pork rind, but it's also deep fried. Now, if you're taking pork skin and you're deep frying it in tallow, it probably doesn't have a lot of linoleic acid, in which case it's not that big a deal. I'm not a huge fan of like deep fried anything because you're just, you're heating an oil quite a bit. It's gonna have lipid peroxides. There's gonna be less, but it's not my favorite thing. Now, if people need something with a crunch, maybe it's okay, but I would really caution against making bacon and bacon fat, that pork fat that is high in linoleic acid or chicken fats, a significant part of your diet if your goals are weight loss. Mm -hmm. And the reason it happens is this, and this gets really technical and we'll probably not do it on this podcast, but if people are interested, they can check out the podcasts I've done over at my podcast, Fundamental Health, or at heartandsoil.co, which is my website. All the videos are up there. Um, you can find me talking about linoleic acid and why it makes you fat. But at a cellular level, there's some really fascinating data that this polyunsaturated fat keeps the adipocytes open to the signaling of insulin. So it keeps your fat cells insulin sensitive. And we've often heard the terminology insulin resistance is bad, insulin sensitivity is good, but that's an oversimplification. At the level of our fat cells, insulin sensitivity is bad because what happens to a tissue when it's insulin sensitive? It gets fatter. And so if your fat cells remain insulin sensitive and they appear to remain incorrectly insulin sensitive when you put lots of linoleic acid into them, uh, then they grow and they grow and they grow and they grow. And we know that fat cells growing is not a good thing for anyone. You don't want your fat cells to grow. In certain survival situations, you might want it to happen, but you don't want your fat cells to grow. And eventually the fat cells get to be so big that they become diseased, they become inflamed, they start releasing excess free fatty acids, no matter what insulin signaling is doing, and they start releasing inflammatory mediators that are part of what we might call the metabolic dysfunction process. This is where we talk about pathological insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Again, the terms insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity are flawed and should be discarded for more precise terms, but we use them so hopefully people understand that. So when I said earlier that if you have metabolic dysfunction, you really need to limit carbohydrates, I think that metabolic dysfunction arises not from excess carbohydrates, at least not excess unprocessed carbohydrates like sweet potato or kabocha. I don't think anybody got diabetes eating kabocha squash. But once you have diabetes, you might not be able to tolerate honey or kabocha squash. But the reason I think most people got diabetes is because they ate too much linoleic acid. Those fat cells got bigger and bigger and bigger, and everybody has a personal fat threshold. And so some people of like East Asian descent or other you know, nationalities or cultures might not even look super fat, but they can have lots of visceral fat, and that is broken fat. And once your fat cells get broken because they get too big, that is when we get metabolically disordered, metabolic dysfunction. And that is what is underlying diabetes and these, all these issues, not so much excess carbs. So just to wrap it all around, like the key is if you know someone with diabetes, if you have diabetes, or if you're obese, the, 
limiting carbs can help, but you have to limit linoleic acid too. And so this is all kind of this thread that's come out of what about pork rinds? Mm -hmm. But hopefully that answers that question. And, and limiting linoleic acid starts with vegetable oils. So things like um, corn, canola, soy, safflower, peanut, et cetera. But it goes much deeper than that because excess linoleic acid hides in a lot of different foods. If you cut out the vegetable oils, you're probably good. But for a lot of people, I would like to see that linoleic acid level even lower. And I think that's what's ideal for humans. And you think like things like bacon and, and, and all that too? I think so. Now, if you want to eat bacon once a year, great. But if you do the math, bacon fat is pretty high in linoleic acid. Mm -hmm. If you look at the fat of a cow, especially a grass-fed, grass-finished cow, it's about 1.6 to 1.8% linoleic acid. Pork fat is about 15 to 20% linoleic acid. So you've 10x the amount of linoleic acid. Now, canola oil is 50% linoleic acid or 40, you know, yeah. depending on the type of canola oil. Safflower is really high. Soybean oil is really high. Some canola oils are lower. But basically, you know, you're, if you're, think about how much vegetable oil someone eats, think about how much bacon fat someone eats. People like save bacon fat in ramekins now mm -hmm. and will use five to six tablespoons of it per day. Like you're getting a lot of linoleic acid in that bacon fat. Now, everybody loves bacon, but I'm just I'm giving them a tool to say, hey, if you're not at the body composition you want to be, decrease linoleic acid in all the sources. And I've seen this. I've one of the, I think one of the most interesting questions that I see on social media and in general is, I'm at a weight loss stall. What should I do? And there's lots of levers you can pull, right? But one of the levers I haven't heard anybody talking about pulling is decrease linoleic acid, increase stearic acid. And stearic acid is this saturated fat. It's basically the saturated fat equivalent of linoleic acid, meaning they're both 18 carbons. And the biochemistry isn't super important, but at a chemical level, at a biochemical level in our cells, they have completely different effects. And this is so crazy. So there's a really interesting interventional study in humans where they put them on a low fat vegan diet for two days. And there's essentially no stearic acid on a low fat vegan diet, which is interesting. And then they gave them a banana milkshake with 26 grams of stearic acid. And they did another experiment where they gave them just pure stearic acid. And when you give someone stearic acid, you see the mitochondria turn on, they fuse. And acyl carnitines, which are a measure of fatty, oxid, fatty acid oxidation, go down. So when you have lower acyl carnitines, you're doing more fatty acid burning, which is beta oxidation, you're burning more fat. So at a high level, you give your body stearic acid, mitochondria turn on, and you burn more fat. That's really cool. And the flip side is also really interesting that if you deprive your body of stearic acid, which is primarily found in animal fats like suet or tallow, um, then your mitochondria are not going to work as well. It's also found in cacao butter and at Heart and Soil, we're coming out with a supplement called Firestarter that has like high stearic acid in like a tallow in a pill for people that don't just want to spoon fat. So mm -hmm. it's really cool to think stearic acid in animal fat is kind of this evolutionary signal that we can be lean. But linoleic acid, which we would have gotten from nuts and seeds, is kind of this evolutionary signal that winter is coming and you have to put on a little bit of weight. And I think the problem is that in 2020, we are giving our body that constant signal to get fat with linoleic acid every day of the year, every single day of the year. Thousands of years ago, we would never have eaten pigs with 15% linoleic acid in their fat. They had 5% linoleic acid. Yeah. We would never have eaten vegetable oils to this extent. We wouldn't have had any vegetable oils. In the fall or in the winter, we might have eaten a few nuts and seeds, and those have more linoleic acid, and those would probably make us a little fatter, but that's a survival mechanism. And now we're kind of hijacking that, I think. This is kind of all my thinking around linoleic mm -hmm. acid and, and where it's come from evolutionarily. But the key is limit linoleic acid, increase stearic acid. So that's your long answer to pork rinds. <laughs> no, no, I love it. Well, can we just, and can we wrap up that thought just so everybody is on the same page? So what would be like the top five foods high in um, like linole linoleic acid versus steric acid. So like the ones that top five you'd want to avoid for linoleic acid and top five you'd want to start consuming more of for steric acid, just so, so for some practicality. Yeah, yeah. So linoleic acid, again, is found in vegetable oils. So you want to eliminate vegetable oils religiously. Mm -hmm. um, and they are found in a lot of foods. You don't want to eat chips cooked in safflower oil, any of that stuff. Like hummus is always going to have canola or safflower in it. So I don't think hummus is a great thing anyway because it's got legumes. <laughs> Um, but you know, the, the vegetable oils are a real problem. And then I think the other foods that are high in linoleic acid are 
and a lot of nuts and seeds, and you can look at individual nuts and seeds, so like sunflower seeds are high in linoleic acid. That's where we get these things from. Um, mm -hmm. Safflower seeds, which nobody eats, but you get it. Sunflower oil, same thing. Peanuts have a decent amount of linoleic acid. I'm not a huge fan of peanuts for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, fat from animals fed corn and soy, like chicken and pork, is gonna be the major sources of linoleic acid. And you can actually check the linoleic acid in your red blood cells. So I do this with my clients and I've done it with myself. You can look at the percentage of linoleic acid in your red blood cell and mine is now down around 5%, but I've had clients, you know, I looked at a guy this morning that was 11, 12% linoleic acid. I think that's just hampering progress to have that much linoleic acid. So you can check it. Mm. Stearic acid is in animal fat. So if you're eating ruminant fat from cows, you're getting a lot of stearic acid. That's the key part. And the best place to get stearic acid is tallow, well, I should say suet, which is kidney fat. And the reason we made fire starter is because kidney fat is very waxy <laughs> and a lot of people don't want to eat suet. Like you can get suet from Belcampo or White Oak and it comes as this block of fat. People are like, what do I do with this? So every morning when I eat breakfast and people are going to be like, oh yeah, I want to eat breakfast with this guy now. He's gross. I have some suet and I just like, I take raw kidney fat and then I'll just plop it into my bone broth when it's hot and it gets a little soft and I, it's good. So it's, but suet is about 25% stearic acid. And cacao butter is also high in stearic acid. Now, I'm not talking about chocolate. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about cacao butter. If you've ever had cacao butter, it tastes like you're chewing a candle because stearic acid is kind of chewy like that. And so does suet. If you just eat suet cold, it's basically like chewing gum fat. It's not mm -hmm. really palatable. But if you drink it with bone broth, you can get it down. Or we encapsulated it into pills just to help people get it. So there's all those options. But I do think it's this really fascinating sort of evolutionary uh, you know, convergence to see, hey, this is found in animal foods. And sure, if you find a cacao tree, you might be able to get some stearic mm -hmm. acid there. But I think mostly we would have gotten it from animal foods. Interesting. Interesting. Cool. Um, okay. So I do have a bunch more questions, but how much time do you have? I don't want to take I'm flexible. Much. Okay. So maybe we'll just do a few more. Uh, I'm gonna, I was going to say maybe we can rapid fire these, but I don't think that's going to be. I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> we've, we've laid the groundwork now. Yeah, we might be yeah. able to do it. Okay, so uh, okay, someone said, is fish oil necessary when eating nose to tail? I guess we can dive into fish a little bit. Yeah, so I'm not an advocate of fish oil mm -hmm. and full stop. Um, and I did a recent video about this. Fish oil is definitely not necessary when you're eating nose to tail. I don't think anyone should be taking fish oil, cod liver oil, any of that stuff. So again, I'm gonna break from the norm here. Do you need omega-3s? Sure, do you need lots of them? No. And if you don't have a lot of linoleic acid, you can convert a lot of your EPA to DHA and DPA, or you can, can even convert the alpha linolenic acid that's found in animal foods into EPA and DHA. So I actually just did a video about that yesterday um, on my social media and on my podcast. Again, all those videos are at heartandsoil.co under the learn tab. But basically what I saw in my fatty acid analysis was I don't do any, I haven't done any eggs. I've been kind of experimenting with no eggs just to see if I had any sensitivities to them. And, you know, I wanted to see maybe I should be eating eggs seasonally like our ancestors would have because eggs have a moderate amount of linoleic acid. I don't want to break people's brain with that because a lot of people like their eggs. So don't worry about yeah. eggs and linoleic acid. That's the least of your concerns. But I was experimenting with it as I'm forging across the Louisiana Purchase with Lewis and Clark. <laughs> but the... Basically, the idea there is just that you want to, you just want to be careful where you're getting that linoleic acid from. And in terms of fish oil, if you get lower amounts of linoleic acid, you will be able to make alpha linolenic acid into EPA, DHA, and DPA. There's a great study that I referenced in the book and I talked about in that recent video and mini podcast that in general, if you give someone alpha linolenic acid in flax seeds, they don't convert any of it into EPA and DHA. And that's probably because the people they gave it to had a lot of linoleic acid in their diet. And flax seeds also have a moderate amount of linoleic acid to prevent that conversion. But if I think that the problem with for most people, now this is not across the board, there definitely are people in the United States in Western society who, who don't get any omega-3 in their diet because they're eating a highly processed diet. Mm -hmm. But for most people, it's not that they're getting too little omega-3. It's that they're getting too much omega-6, specifically linoleic acid. And that is preventing the interconversion of the omega-3s from you know ALA to EPA to DPA and DHA because they share a pathway, a series of elongases and desaturases that make those. And they're shared between the omega-6 and the omega-3 family. So if you get too much omega-6, you will prevent the interconversion of the omega-3. So in answer to that question, fish oil is not a good option. It's highly oxidized. I would throw it out, 
throw out your cod liver oil, just throw it out and just eat some animal fat or even some egg yolks. You'll be fine. And what's your take on, like, do you include fish in, in your diet at all? Like, I don't personally fish? because it's so dirty these days. I think that it, every once in a while, if I have the opportunity to eat like really good wild salmon, I will do it. Um, I certainly like seafood. I like oysters. I like mussels. But, you know, every time I look at them, I'm like, wow, that's a lot of cadmium. That's a lot of mercury, like shellfish are pretty high and stuff. So just know what you're getting in terms of heavy metals from fish. And I do worry about people making fish the majority of their diet. I just don't think it's a healthy choice for most humans. And it's not to say that it wasn't a healthy choice evolutionarily. It's that my sense is like eating fish is kind of like eating cattle raised in downtown Tokyo or in Beijing. You know, do you want to eat cattle who are breathing the worst air in the world? fish are swimming in polluted waters like that's just the that's just the, the fact of the matter um i'm not a fan of sardines because they just sit in that can forever and i burp the hell out of them i just think they're highly oxidized um it's just like fish oil people get the fish oil burps because it's really oxidized you're not supposed to burp up fish when you eat fish mm -hmm. i mean i've had some good salmon in my life and a good king salmon is pretty hard to pass up but i don't make it the majority of my diet i don't even make it a small part of my diet it's, it's just an occasional here and there. If I were up in British Columbia and I was fishing for, for Alaskan or for king salmon, you bet I would eat it. But mm -hmm. I, 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 the other part of, this, part of this equation is I don't think there's anything in fish you can't get other places. And that's our previous discussion. You can get plenty of omega-3 from animal fat, suet, mm -hmm. tallow, those kind of things. It'll give you plenty of omega-3, especially if you're eating less linoleic acid. And, and my results and the results of others show that very clearly. It's not to say we don't need any, just not that we don't want we don't need massive amounts of omega-3. Mm -hmm. And while I'm talking about this, just so people don't get confused, linoleic acid is technically considered an essential fatty acid, but it's in food. Like there's a small amount in, you know, grass-fed beef. You're not going to get deficient in linoleic acid by restricting it. You're not going to get deficient in linoleic acid by eating whole foods. If somebody just ate potatoes, yeah, you could get a linoleic acid deficiency um, along with basically a deficiency of everything, everything else. <laughs> but if you're eating whole animal foods, you won't get deficient in linoleic acid. Normally you get deficient in the omega-3s. Gotcha. Okay. Makes sense. Um, all right. Let's do two more here. Um, I kind of went all over the place. So, Okay. This is a good one. And we kind of talked about this, but someone said loose stools on carnivore. And well, this is kind of another two part, but loose stools on carnivore and how to reintroduce veggies if one doesn't want to be carnivore forever. So that's kind of two different questions. Maybe we can end on that one or those two. Yeah. So a lot of people. So I think that if you transition from high fiber to zero fiber, there's going to be a increased passage of bile salts through the ileocecal valve into the colon. And that's gonna cause loose stool. So the answer to that is just add a little bit of fiber back into your diet and that should bind up the bile salts and you have to transition. So people get loose stool on carnivore. They just went from too much fiber to too little fiber too quickly, generally speaking. And again, I have no problem with fiber if you tolerate it, just don't, you don't need it. Again, I don't have any fiber. My stools are formed every day, they're, they're great. Um, but so that's the answer to that one. And it's okay to add avocado or squash back in if that helps with that diarrhea at the beginning. But if you transition and you go from high fiber to low fiber, you, those bile salts are gonna be overproduced and it's gonna take the small intestine a little bit of time to reabsorb them. Okay. And, but then you should get to the point, most people get to the point where they, it kind of stops as you adjust to it. To reintroduce veggies, I mean, my, my gentle suggestion is maybe don't reintroduce vegetables. Maybe just think about reintroducing the least toxic plant foods. If you really want to reintroduce spinach or kale, just think hard about why you're doing that. Um, I'm, I'm just not sure that they're good for humans, but you could just reintroduce them. I mean, you can do whatever you need to do. Uh, I think that my, my simple answer to that question would be reintroduce the foods that are lower on the plant toxicity spectrum, reintroduce avocado, reintroduce squash. And people might think of those as vegetables, but I think of them as mm -hmm. fruit, botanically speaking. So that would be my choice rather than doing veggies. I just don't think that leafy greens and nuts and seeds and grains and legumes form a significant part of the human diet. Um, they're really survival foods. What you, what you wanna focus on is meat and organs for your nutrition and then use the plants that are less toxic to fill in for color, variety, texture, and flavor. And if you can't do organs, consider something like the desiccated organs we make at Hardened mm -hmm. Soil, which you know kind of freeze dries all kinds of things into capsules and makes it easier. So hopefully that helps people too.
Okay, okay. And I guess I haven't seen this anywhere, but I'm sure you probably have something. Do you have like a, a spectrum or maybe like some type of like infographic that shows the plant toxicity spectrum that you've, you've been talking about or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. So that's in the book. So in the carnivore okay. code, there's that book, but I'll, um, I'll pull it up. If you let me screen share, I can screen share it right now. Sure. I don't. So if whoever's listening to this won't see it, but um, we can do it for the YouTubers. I don't know how to screen share. <laughs> there's like that little button at the bottom that says screen share. And then there's oh. a carrot next to it. And you just have to put like allow participants to screen share. Oh, it's letting me do it. Okay. Okay. So you see this? So this is from okay. the book. Um, less toxic, moderate, most toxic. And so the most toxic is nuts, grains, legumes, and seeds, which are all seeds. High oxalate foods, which are a lot of the, um, which are a lot of the leaves. Brassica vegetables, kale, collard, uh, things like that. Lettuce is probably not a great thing for most people. Nightshades, which are tomatoes, eggplant, bell peppers, hot peppers. Tubers are in the middle. Um, sweet fruits in the middle, but probably more this direction over here. And then mm -hmm. berries, squash, non-sweet fruits like avocado. So um, really I'd put the cutoff somewhere like right here. Like I would avoid these foods and consider these as you would. And these are probably better for most people. Make sense? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, I had a few more questions, but maybe we'll save those for a part two. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I do want to end on one question that I always ask, um, and I feel like I already know the answer to this, but maybe you have another one that you want to share. Okay. So what is something that you've changed your mind about in the last year and why? So yeah, you, you probably do know the answer to this. It's, it would just be cycling ketosis. Um, it's always humbling but also revealing to think that as truth seekers and scientists, we can say, hey, I expanded my perspective on this, right? Or, or even just to say, hey, I didn't, I didn't fully, I wasn't thinking about this fully. I mean, I've, I went deep into the literature understanding ketones and how valuable ketogenic states were for humans. But I think that in the last year, I've just expanded my perspective to think, huh, I'm not sure it's the end all be all. I'm not sure we always need to be in ketosis. And I don't think it's beneficial for people to be in ketosis all the time. And I think that people run into problems and we see that. The cognitive dissonance occurs when we say, hey, but there's people that get benefit. And, and I, you know, there's just a lot of black and white thinking out there. Like, how can someone get benefit if it's not good to do it all the time? And it's like, well, because a lot of things in life are supposed to be cyclic and kind of balanced. And, you know, evolutionarily, I'm pretty sure there were times we didn't have carbohydrates and we didn't have even food and we were in ketosis. That's not a bad thing. And I think a lot of the work that I did defending ketogenic diets was, was great because there are definitely those people in the space who would say ketones are bad for you. And it's like, well, mm -hmm. that's crazy too. Like to say that a ketogenic state is harmful to humans is, is silly. There are a lot of things that happen in, when we're in ketosis that are beneficial and all sorts of epigenetic changes and stuff that are beneficial and probably great in small doses. So yeah, that's been an interesting one. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Yeah, that's probably the biggest one. Love it. Love it. Definitely went through all of that myself as well. And that's, again, where the podcast came from because metabolic flexibility, that's, I'm all about it. But, oh, were you going to say something? Well, just to, just, I think that it's, it, it just speaks, I think it's just, and I, I know that your fans appreciate this, but it speaks volumes about you and other people in the space when they're willing to be intellectually flexible, I think. And um, I'm always disappointed when people in the community are stuck on dogma and no, 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 you know, but I think that it's a lot of, a lot of benefit when people, and those are the people I respect most in the space who are willing to say, Hey, I've, I'm expanding my perspective here. I think that we all have seen benefit in things and then learned that, that there, there's more to the story and that's what it's all about. And so I, I hope that I, I'm sure your listeners appreciate that about you, but that's amazing. I appreciate that too. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you and all of your kind of growth through in, within this industry as well. And it just, it's just really fun to kind of, you know, watch people kind of evolve and also evolve within yourself. But yeah, it's like the health and fitness industry in itself is just still so new and like still there's just so much to learn. And so I think if you, if you're in this industry and you, and you're dogmatic about things, it's like, you're just setting yourself up to not, not, not be good down the line, I think. But yeah, and that's because that's, you know, we've both been through it. So anyway, <laughs> um, all right. So before we, this is awesome. Before we end, do you want to kind of share um, with our listeners, kind of talk about your new company and then also where they can find you on social media, website, all that fun stuff? Yeah. So the best place to find me is heartandsoil.co. And it's just, it's been really fun to build this company out of my interest in helping people get 
Good nutrition. I thought about my sister and her kids and my family. They're never going to eat spleen. They're never gonna, <laughs> they're never going to eat kidney. They probably won't even ever eat liver. And so it's like, well, I want to make I want to make good freeze-dried supplements. Right now we're sourcing from New Zealand. It's grass-fed, grass-finished, and we're developing a regenerative supply chain in the US. And then because we're supporting regenerative agriculture, that's where the soil part of it comes from. I think that we didn't get into it on this podcast, but I talk about it in my book. The importance of supporting agriculture that enriches the soil quality is is paramount. And uh, you know, I think that, that that's an important thing. And it really disarms so many of the arguments about the sustainability of animals on the planet and animal agriculture. And so I, I'm just really excited and proud to be able to help people get more of these organs in their diet in a more convenient way that still preserves as many of the nutrients as possible through freeze drying from the best sources we can in a way that supports the farms that are doing good work. So that's just super cool. And it's Heart and Soil, heartandsoil.co. At the website, you'll find information about regenerative agriculture, about who I am, how I eat, all my podcasts, all my videos. It's just, it's become the site where everything is there. Um, on social, I'm at carnivoremd, but really if you go to hardensoil.co, you'll find everything there. So, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, I will for sure link that in the show notes so everybody can find it. Um, and I will be checking that out myself as well. Um, but yeah, this was super fun. Thank you so much for taking the time and I'll probably have to do another one with all the other questions we have, but my we'll pleasure. set that up. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Okay.